I think we should be live now. Oh, hello. I'm Mark Davenport. I'm here with... Heidi Hörnlein. We're from the Wisdom Factory, which is a forum to connect people who have experience, knowledge, and wisdom to share with the world. We're counselors and coaches deeply inspired by Ken Wilber and his integral theory. Uh, the Wisdom Factory is our contribution to spread the wisdom of the integral worldview. And again, this year in May, we will be contributing at the second European Integral Conference in Hungary. Come over and join us at the conference. Yeah, I hope some of you come. Yes. Last year we met Jeff there. Yeah. It was mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, we did. We've met lots of folks. Yeah. Um, today, though, is the last of the 13 episodes of our current series, Stop the Relationship. Grow your relations. <laughs> and as we have many guests on our panel today, we might well go over the hour mark. Just warning. <clears throat> you have to leave. You will find the replays, as always, on the replay page and in edited form at Bitly Wisdom Factory, where you can find all replays of the main shows as well as of the after show blabs. There'll be one of those after the show too. All with timestamps for efficient viewing for only a $29 membership for all of 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So today we have invited our presenters who were present from today to now and gave us wonderful talks. And we come together to discuss the topic of relationships and we want to bring it in a little bit a bigger uh, how do you say, a, a bigger context. So, but first of all, I will call on everybody and ask them to present themselves and go from our left to our right. And on our left, there is David Ameland. Mm -hmm. Hello. Could you say a little bit about you? Uh, because yeah, we sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am, um, well, I, I write books for a living, primarily. I uh, consult with some large companies within the field of search and social media and internal communications. And these days, increasingly, trust, which has to do a lot with relationships and, as it turns out, everything else, like marketing and social media and search and so on and so on. Yeah. And uh, I also occasionally take workshops in large uh, conferences and I speak across the world. And that, in a nutshell, is me. <laughs> so thank you, Thanks. David. And next on our row is Jeff, Jeff Salzman. Hi folks, I'm Jeff Salzman and I am a integral practitioner and I have uh, been in the integral scene for oh, 10 or 11 years now with the Integral Institute and worked with Ken very closely for three years there and I uh, started Boulder Integral uh, which is the a center for integral study here in Boulder and uh, and then I, I do the Daily Evolver which is a weekly podcast and blog that where I look at integral um, pers take, try to take an integral perspective on current events, politics, uh, spirituality and that sort of thing. So happy to be with you. Thank you. Thanks. And come to Catherine Woodward Thomas. Ah, uh, Hello everyone. Um, well, I'm an author, I'm a teacher, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, I just recently had uh, a book of mine hit the New York Times bestseller list, which I'm super grateful hey. for. That's Conscious Uncoupling, Five Steps to Living Happily Even After. And uh, I'm most known for my other book, Calling in the One, which is about um, preparing ourselves for a relationship from the inside out. And this is the result of my courses with you. I'm, I I'm the trophy. Him. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> my one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Heidi's one of my coaches. Yes. Coaches. I'm very honored yeah, by I that. Did everything what you offered, all the trainings, it was really a great time. And there I got to know also Kim Carpenter. I go over to you first, Kim. Hi. Well, Lisa's going to introduce um, both of us, but yeah, Catherine is the connection between Heidi and myself, which is just so amazing. Such a small world when we get right down to it. It really is. 
Do you, oh, do you want me to? Yeah. Okay. So, and, and I'm Lisa Ingalls. So Kim and I are partners, business partners, and our business is called Wake Up and Change the World, and it's an online marketing consultancy that provides purpose-driven strategy, really, and training and courses that accelerate business growth and community engagement and social impact. And our business is really informed by um, integral theory. And I'm a part of, of the Center for Integral Wisdom think tank as well, which uh, Ken is a part of the Center for Integral Wisdom. is highly informed what's going on there as well. So I think integral um, definitely is a, a connector here for, for us as well. And right now we're in our Oakland, California headquarters, which is just my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's a virtual business <laughs> work from home. Yeah. Okay. okay, and then we come to Martin Uchik. Hello, everyone. I, as you probably can hear by my accent, like Heidi, grew up in Germany and was married for 14 years, have three kids, moved to the U.S. in '95. And after a very amicable divorce uh, in 2002, started the day Northern Californian postmodern women, which completely left me baffled and confused and heartbroken <laughs> and whatnot. Uh -oh. and after four years of more or less struggles with short interruptions of bliss, <laughs> too, um, I discovered Ken Wilbur's integral map and. Somehow a light went on that that my struggles and my troubles would be clarified, or you know, it was just like finding the map for the territory of age relationships, and was quite surprised that there wasn't a book that that applied Ken's model to love relationships. And since I wanted to have it, I wrote it, and so here I am, honored to be with you all, wonderful people, most of you I know. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, having a workshop today about integral relationships, haven't you? Yeah, the whole weekend, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, okay. I've been in Frankfurt and in Munich, and now in the UK, Tuesday, I come back to sunny California. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my intent, our intent, yeah. mm -hmm. was to ask you, I mean, we have talked about relationships, love relationships, about uh, separating, about a trust and about business relationships, and all these things. Relationships, isn't it the pillar of everything in the world? I mean, what has have relationship to do with the world, with our present state of the world? And just, just I'll throw it out and you jump in where you, where you oh. want. Maybe we should invite Martin to comment first, because he's got this other thing happening after okay. our show. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you'd like to go first, Martin, that would be fine. Yeah. So you can scoot out whenever you need to. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I agree that relationships are at the foundation of human beings. We, we have very obviously very unique relationships with each other, and there is you know, there's some philosophers around the world who, who think that only through our the way that that sexuality went beyond procreation, we actually developed language and, and developed consciousness. And, uh, there's there's other theories, of course, but I think it's our at the base of our humanness, uh, having symbolic language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And love relationships, in, in my opinion, are unique in a way that. Uh, if you're familiar with the chakras, they really include all the, the seven chakras, including sexuality and in a committed relationship, sharing money, and, and things that are unique, you know, that are not shared in other relationships. And another thing that I think romantic relationships are unique because we can get away with quite a bit of bullshit in, in any other relationship where we're not more or less observed 24-7. So we often have a certain self-image that can be negative or positive, and and a romantic partner has a unique way of getting to know us and reflect back to us when our inner world is not aligned with our exterior behavior, and and uh, you know we discover obviously our shadows. You know the best and the worst usually comes out when we when we're in a romantic relationship, which. Uh, 
makes it quite different from, from other relationships, which are, of course, equally valid and important. And finally, I may say, you know, obviously, relationships have developed over the history of humanity from tribal magical relationships where usually the alpha males had access to the females and then to more egocentric relationships where maybe there was more of a pair bond and then the traditional pair bond, you know, kind of like the religiously uh, influenced traditional marriage that at least from the outside would have been monogamous and then the modern marriage or relationship where couples tend to find each other to support each other in you know having a good life and being successful and succeed and realize their their goals and then we have the postmodern relationships which are often then in addition to the all the previous levels have so like a spiritual and more of a more psychological healing oriented connotation and then the integral relationship which is the name of my book kind of integrates all the healthy aspects of these other forms of relationships and tries to transcend the unhealthy aspects of you know the the levels of the previous relationships or the aspects of the previous relationships so that would be my little contribution <laughs> thank you okay but need to ask you one question before you scoot out or whatever and that is wow as you went up the the spiral there those relationships got a lot more complicated and a lot more demanding. Ooh, it used right. to be pretty simple. But <laughs> when I was a kid, they were really simple. But yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Two weeks ago, somebody said, I don't want to be at this integral level. This is way too complicated. Oh, I settle for some <laughs> kind of. <laughs> So what yeah. I come to understand also with the relationship with, I have created with Mark that personal relationships, intimate relationships are a very good school for other relationships. So I want just to throw that in because I personally believe when we are able to have good relationships with ourselves and with our intimate partners, all of us then the world would look differently. And that's a little bit what inspired me to to ask you what have relationships to do with the present state of of the world. I encourage you to take uh, the word whoever wants. Uh, it's not we are here to say now you and now you and now you. Come on, go. I'll I'll speak next. Um, I'm actually moved by the question, and I don't always get to talk about the larger context as you're presenting it. And I think that's probably true for all of us. We're involved in the relationships that people have hired us to help them with or you know, what people are a particular aspect. But I think what you're speaking to is kind of the, the underlying impulse towards making relationship our area of contribution. Um, I know for me on a personal level that um, sometimes walking through this world is very painful because of the lack of relatedness. I think it's particularly acute in America, and I think it's particularly acute actually in Los Angeles where I make my home now, um, which is I think the downside of diversity in a way because in a, a city that's as diverse as LA, and LA is probably the most diverse city in the world, um, people are not together in anything. So I'm in New York or two, so when I go to New York, we're at least in the experience together of being New Yorkers. There's an, a New Yorker identity. And so that creates a field of relatedness. But very often in our world, we walk around kind of, you know, isolated, disconnected. And I, uh, I think those of us who are here to support the evolution of the awakening of relatedness, the awakening of the field between us, um, are are feeling the absence of that very often, pretty acutely. So I would imagine that. So for the listeners who are here and joining us on our conversation. And the way that I've come to see it is that it's life's way of, of, of beginning the creative process of that which is emergent, which is really the awakening of um, consciousness of, of, of we are together. We are, you know, it, it's, the, it's the lived field of oneness. And I think all of us have also been in environments where somehow the facilitators of that environment 
create con enough containment and enough uh, context for that to wake up. And it truly is heaven on earth because there's abundance everywhere. Everywhere we go, our needs are met and there's no scarcity. And also relationship, it seems to be the currency of magic. That when we live in a field of relatedness, synchronicity happens, magic happens, things just line up, things work. So the world works to the extent that that field of relatedness is awake within us. And the world doesn't work when we're out of relationship. So I'm just happy to be in a conversation that's presencing that and what we're all really here for and aspiring to. Oh, Catherine, I think it's interesting that both you and Martin, the intimate relationship experts, are in Los Angeles, <laughs> you know, where where you're really needed. That's what I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Well, um, let me add a few things to this. I think um, both Catherine and Martin made some incredible, um, drew some incredible insights on this. Um, I mean, we talk about relationships and relatedness and how everything is connected and Catherine in particular spoke about the disconnect that people feel and how that can be quite um, um, injurious both to their lives and their relationships and everything else that happens to them and it's it's very very true and essentially um, as the world has evolved throughout the 20th century the scaling of everything which we did contributed to that remote aspect of the individual and is uh, being disconnected from what we would call his community or the tribe um, and things are gradually changing uh, technology is playing a huge part not least the fact of what we're doing right here where you know we're in different parts of the world different time zones different depths of expertise and experience and we're drawn together to discuss something which is very um, common to our different fields but it's overlapping because it's connected and it also resonates with an audience which is equally diverse and equally geographically um, scattered and this is part of a change which is challenging and also very encouraging and I think this is what we're seeing in many different ways um, you know our contribution whatever to whatever level it may be is only a tiny part of something else which a lot of people are feeling right across the globe uh, you know they connect through hangouts they connect through Skype they connect their phones they even connect through Facebook and chat and everything else and all this is catalytic in many different ways so the world of the 21st century hasn't yet taken shape or form everything which we see now which is a challenge is part of an evolutionary process which you know has only just begun so it has quite some way to go I'll hop in on this um, conversation and segue from what everybody is seeing and um, I know that you know many of you here that I've talked to a lot, including David and Heidi and Kim and Mark, um, know that I've been sort of like this this caller out or of like right now we are living in a time where there is a connection crisis, in my opinion. I saw a um, article that was written in Forbes magazine that was a set study that was done on Facebook about Facebook which is the world's largest social network meant right to connect us and yet they're finding this study found that Facebook is causing people to feel more depressed and isolated and disconnected because of social comparison isn't it ironic here we live in a world where we have the ability to be more connected than ever before and yet we're comparing ourselves so so then we can take this a step further and and David's really such an amazing author about all of this around trust right connection if we're suffering a connection crisis we also have a trust crisis and if we have a trust crisis we also have an intimacy crisis right we're suffering and intimacy is what relationship is about Right, so there's this narrative that I believe um, we have the opportunity to change, but it's in us coming together and having these conversations that create connection, which then create trust and intimacy 
to begin to change the narrative. So what is the narrative around relationship that we're moving towards and that wants to emerge in us, through us, as us, as, um, as David put really nicely, like we all have these different perspectives. We all have our unique self perspectives and we can come together as a unique self symphony with that. And, and so it, I just put back into the, the conversation, what is that narrative? that we're moving towards? What wants to emerge? It's, it's one of community, essentially. I mean, we all, we're all social animals and instinctively we're driven towards that. Now, there's a legacy um, behind us for the last hundred plus years where everything was really competitive. In order to get to a particular position, you had to exclude somebody else from that position. It was a zero-sum game. And that um, basically fractured the traditional sense of the community, it fractured the con traditional sense of uh, having a support network that we used to have in the past, and it caused all sorts of issues as, as a result. And we are sensing that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, we can have a community, you can have a, a cooperative approach to getting ahead, which does not exclude you from getting somewhere and doesn't automatically exclude somebody else also getting somewhere. I mean, you know, we're, we're in a cooperative sharing society right now um, where we share openly ideas and data and information and we don't hoard it anymore because we don't associate the hoarding of information and unique insights with reputational value. It's quite the opposite. That is quite disruptive and we're still learning how to adjust to that um, and a lot of the challenges which we face is the transition from that legacy of the 20th century to a new way of connecting the 21st where we actually don't have to compete all the time, where we can raise everybody equally instead of trying to elevate ourselves by demoting everybody else. So, you know, these are things which we have to unlearn and relearn. So it, it's not an easy thing. And obviously, I do, it's not helped by the context in which we operate in. I mean, I, I frequently go into corporate structures which are really hierarchical and still have a legacy of the 20th century to the extent sometimes that I am introduced to the management wing where there are management cubicles, offices with closed doors and there are managers there separate from the workforce they're supposed to manage. And nobody knows who they are really or what they do and it's really weird. It's like, you know, going back into the past. But that is reflective of a particular mentality which is very slow to change and what we see across the world in, in businesses and corporations and brands is reflected in society and communities and social structures and then it, it, it comes down to individual relationships and many times it also goes up from individual relationships because in the 20th century, 20th century we learned that you know you didn't have to have a particular trusting relationship to make it work provided you had the kind of dynamic that did make it work and we really know that unless you have that deep openness and vulnerability in a relationship um, it, it's not going to work long term it's going to have issues um, it's not going to be symmetrical enough for it to function and that experience from there is going to taint everything else around you so it's a very complex fluid environment we're in trust is both measurable and ethereal at the same time you sort of know it when we see it, but at the same time we also have mechanisms which allow us to measure it in particular contexts, if it's a commercial environment for example, or um, some sort of um, uh, enterprise driven situation, or even you know between two countries and the deals they make. So how we sort of reconcile the knowledge which we have now and make it apply equally at everything is, uh, is a huge challenge because you know we're learning all the time and, and situations change and the environment is still not quite um, uniform in terms of how it operates. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll actually address a little bit of what you uh, asked in the beginning, Heidi, about the state of the world and how that's being reflected here. Um, I, I, th I think one of the um, emergent uh, things that's happening on the planet is that we have the, the global brain where of course with communications and social networks and so forth people can find each other all over the planet like we are right now I mean even ten years ago 
this would not have been possible to find, what do we have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight needles in the haystack who have got together because we all care about this and all think and, you know, have some shared worldview, and we can actually move the ball. And uh, what Ken says about that is that thoughts are things. Actually, thoughts, even though they're happening in the upper left quadrant, they are material, actually. They're just ethereal material. And so thoughts and conversations actually create grooves in the cosmos. And so that's what we're doing now, and this is happening all over the world in a million different ways right now, in ways that have never happened before. And a lot of what's happening as this new skin of the most progressed people, you might say, the most developed people uh, getting together uh, is a lot of what you folks are talking about, these, these qualities of flexibility of mind and, and, and you know, just new ways of dealing with each other and new challenges of dealing with each other. And then also we have this other thing that's going on is that there are people uh, at every stage of development that are, and some, some of them are being left behind. Some of them are, you know, they're all operating and using this modern or postmodern tool of the global communications technology, but they're using it to, you know, further the advance of the worldview that they have. And so you have uh, the internet bringing the Ku Klux Klan back, you know, with a new resurgence, because they can find each other too, just like we can. And, you know, how ISIS is using it and how even what you were talking about, I think it's Lisa, of uh, people using Facebook is just another means of com competing with each other, which, you know, human beings are very good at, particularly at a certain stage of development. And so now we do it at this, this sort of hyper technological pace that is destructive. I mean, I notice it's this, there's a destructive quality of this for me uh, in my life. Uh, simply because I noticed that I haven't read a good novel in the last five years. And it's not for lack of trying. I just haven't been able to because I can't concentrate and quiet down and get in a deep groove like I used to. I'm a, a, you know, I've read my whole life. But what I do is I peck at the keyboard and I get this from Reddit, and I go to this news source, and I talk to this person, and I'm on with you folks, and I'm, and I'm taking a full advantage of the buffet of possibilities. And, um, and, and that's a good thing, too. You know, Ken talks about the difference between depth and span, and they're both really important. Uh, but I notice that depth, is being sacrificed to span. And at least I'm at the level of conscious incompetence. That's progress. It used to be unconscious incompetence. So on to conscious competence and unconscious competence. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, this is great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's hard to follow. <laughs> I mean, in the as one comedian after another. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the way you put that. Uh, God, as, as Jeff has, you know, the depth and span. And uh, <clears throat> and in my sort of like world of, of couples and, and dating and relating, there is also this, as many probably of you know, that the more choices people have, the harder it becomes for them to choose. And then when they chose, they're more unhappy with what they chose than people who had fewer choices. And so in, in the world of social media and online dating, I see we, we see that a lot that before depth can be reached in certain relationships, you know, and through solving problems and and you know working on the relationship, very often there are so many different options that people then, you know, before they create more depth. Of course, there are the exceptions, but generally speaking, you know, I had the same feeling as Jeff about depth and span. Mm -hmm. Can that also be that it is, you know, for for a time that we need to come out of meditative depths and do that, and then maybe we go back to it? 
that this time is asking us to do the connection work and to do not let the internet to be uh, uh, taken over by ISIS or Ku Klux Khan or whatever, but bring our contribution here and maybe later we come back or I'm, you know, I don't know. Well, I think that's happening, if I may say. Um, of course, in terms of ISIS and stuff, there, there's a redoubling and tripling of efforts to shut them down on the internet. For God's sake, it's our internet people. You know, they're just hijacking it. So please, uh, <laughs> but but also um, the um, what were you saying, Heidi? That um, um, I lost the train of thought. Oh, sorry, I did. It's about the time that maybe now it's the time to do that. What we are doing now, and oh, that yes. we don't read mm -hmm. any more novels. Maybe yes. later. We, yeah, we I think there's a, a new movement. I see it among particularly millennials. There's a wonderful scene in a movie with Ben Stiller where he's a 40-something and he's trying to befriend these young 20s. And they're in a cafe and they are having a conversation. There's some need for a piece of information. And he picks up his phone to find out what, you know, the fact they need to know is. And she puts her hand on his and says, let's just not know. And I thought that was really lovely and, and funny, of course, too. And there seems to be, there's, I, I, I saw that there's a, a, a movement in, in New York among millennials to have these confabs where everybody comes in, puts their phone face down on the table, and then they have a dinner so that there's no interruptions. And people are getting hip. Uh, the cover of Time magazine, the amazing uh, epidemic of erectile dysfunction among men under the age of 27 because their brains are saturated in porn. And how that is a, you know, a, a, a serious thing, and and you know how men are getting hip to that and turning it off. So I think there's a turn it off movement that you know what we'll do is like human beings, we always sort of overshoot the mark and we get all excited about what's new, and then we figure out the downside and we sort of integrate a new uh, synthesis, which will continually get the keep bringing forth the best of both. So the poll is, you know, depth versus span. And we just continually work that. Probably hunter-gatherers probably worked that polarity. But we're working it in our own way at this time. And David, seeing you in a small picture, but I think you've been smiling and <laughs> even laughing. Uh, yeah, I, I pretty much agree with what Jeff said in terms of the um, the way our brains work, and they have worked like that for a long, long time. And the fragmentation of our tension, which we experience today, which some say, well, it's a challenge, right? Because you're being pulled at all in all directions at once. Well, it's always been that way. It's the way that our brains evolved to actually function. And um, it's it's just a way of what we need to do is to, to find a way to make it work um, when suddenly it has been exponentially augmented in terms of the information flow and what we're exposed to and what we can do. I mean, you know, Jeff gave the, the example of uh, porn consumption, which is a real problem amongst uh, a section of the population, but that's just, you know, growing up and growing up in the sort of um, uh, more sort of figurative sense of the word and learning to, to create the coping mechanisms that will allow you to become uh, a a, a person of your time. And I think that's the maturation process that we all struggle with, um, irrespective of age and irrespective of, um, of, of, of you know, background. Um, it is something, you know, it's all, all, the, all the things which we juggle and which then become part of our constructed identity, which allows us to move forward. And that's the narrative of us, you know, which makes us people of our time. It makes us a thread of a wider narrative. What is interesting is it can't really happen or have any kind of effect if there's no real community feeling, if there's no group to which you think you think you belong to, you feel you're part of. And whether that is a local group or you know a digital group which is diver um, um, uh, geographically diverse and dispersed is immaterial as long as it is there. And I think this is the comment that the importance of the comment that Lisa made earlier about Facebook, which is a social network. Essentially, it's not. It's a technical psychosocial construct. It groups people together. Unless the conditions are there for community creation, what do we get? We get a bunch of individuals who live in their little boxes and compare each other to see who's going to rise to the top on any particular day. 
essentially self-destructive. Change the conditions, change the way this operates, and suddenly that kind of comparison, that kind of negativity and self-destructiveness tends to go away. It doesn't always happen in every social network. Within Google+, Plus, for instance, where the, again, it's another psychosocial construct, but the conditions which are which exist for connections there are entirely different and the sort of the overall trend which we see in that social network is that people try to group with other people whom they have never met before and they try to find out how they can help each other because that's where you get a sense of gain in terms of information and access and broadening of horizons which then lead to relationships which then lead to, to, to sort of benefits and trust and, and wider networks being formed. Um, it is incredibly empowering. It is absolutely challenging uh, because um, it's challenging at a personal level. You, you know, the instance, I mean, uh, Jeff mentioned Ku Klux Klan and the internet. It is a natural tendency to group with people who are like us. So if you happen to be a member of Ku Klux Klan, you're going to look for other Ku Klux Klan members. Why? Because you know what they're like, so therefore you have a sense of trust in their out view and how they're going to react and so on, which allows you to build a relationship with them. What does that mean for relationships across a digital divide? Is that basically you need to challenge yourself. We need to challenge ourselves in keeping an open mind, in being hypercritical of our own points of view, being aware of our own biases, and being able at times to simply change your opinion and change your mind, which is not an easy thing to do. And I think if we manage to do these things, there's a constant evolution which will take place, and it is taking place, which will lead us to something amazing. It will lead us essentially to one world because, again, Jeff made a very good point. Every thought you have, which is immaterial and you can't see, actually has a psychological stroke physical by a basis, which starts in your head, which starts from input, which is there, which starts from sensory perception, which starts from um, mental constructs coming from that perception. So as those things change, our thoughts change. As our thoughts change, our actions change. It leads to a chain of events which eventually does actually change the world from these little connections. It's a slow process, but taken collectively, it becomes a massive thing. So, you know, it's a good beginning. We just need to wait to see where it's going to lead us. This is great saying, and I will come back to Catherine because she is one of the teachers who teach you that, which thoughts are, let's say, real thoughts, and which are the, what we call a false beliefs. Would you like to talk a little bit about the reality, what uh, th think thoughts uh, bring into relationship life? Um, I think what's happening in the United States right now is that um, interiority, the development of interiority has gone mainstream. And uh, we have a lot of people like, uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey or Maria Shriver to thank for that because these are women who are, um, who are making it uh, like a, sp a spiritual practice to notice what we feel, to take responsibility for our feelings, to be able to differentiate feelings from thoughts. And all of these are laying the groundwork really for a whole new way of being in relationship with each other. Uh, and I think that we're all, I'm sure, aligned on the idea or the aspiration towards more conscious relationship, whether we're having, we're talking about intimate relationships or we're talking about about how we're presenting ourselves on the internet and engaging with people on the internet. And I loved, I loved this idea that what's missing is simply leadership on Facebook. That it's actually like a leadership issue um, that I think David was just talking about. And so the the I'm sorry, my girls just walked in. We're in Las Vegas, by the way, on a family holiday right now. So um, so uh, this idea though that what's emerging is in, in relationship both within ourselves and then communally and on the internet that generates connection beyond that competition is the authenticity and the vulnerability of what it is to be human. And so even experts are now kind of discovering a human voice and expertise. I think Brene Brown has really had a huge impact in America and I would imagine throughout Europe as well. Um, with her voice, 
which is so transparent and she's kind of leading this whole movement but you see this is creating um, th this is you know in the in the online learning communities that I've been leading for the last seven years one of the wonderful things about them is that um, people do feel safe to be authentic and vulnerable and it does generate a deep sense of tribe that's global and international it's quite wonderful across boundaries and borders and nationalities and um, income levels you know it, it dissipates hierarchy and um, and, uh, and and creates truthfully there's a lot of love that can emerge in a virtual community so maybe it's you know up on Facebook if that became the real thing like if it became a dialogue about what I'm struggling with and where I'm how I'm finding my courage today and where I'm stretching and growing I've kind of been playing a lot with this word um, levolutionary you know that we're really here to evolve our collective capacity to love and be loved and many of us feel this way and so so you know how we are in every interaction is one expression of that how we are on Facebook is another expression of that so I'm kind of you know toying with that today I appreciate the conversations because getting me interested in how we might actually generate a new culture on Facebook <laughs> Or in all the social media, you know, and connect yeah. in this way more often yeah. and bring this energy together out into the universe. <laughs> I'm wondering, Martin, you probably are on tiptoes. <laughs> I would like to give you some space to, and for instance, I would. Can, I, can I just interrupt for one second? Okay. It's missing for me that Kim hasn't spoken, and I know that when working with women for so long, it's very easy for the women to step back and let the men speak. So I really appreciate that you invited me to to, to speak because it's my tendency too to push back and listen to the men. <laughs> so I just want a presence that Kim hasn't spoken yet. Yeah. Thanks, I'm Catherine. Yeah, I actually was on my tiptoes, Heidi. So if I could go before Martin, that would be great. <laughs> and I just, you know, I've I've had such a tremendous benefit of experiencing Catherine's work and that idea of the field of relatedness. And so, in the work I'm doing with Lisa and Wake Up and Change the World, it is how do we bring that into business? And in all of those small business owners that we're working with, there's such a deep longing to have true connection, authenticity, and relatedness to their clients. And so um, it is this whole new way of being because people are being taught to position themselves as an expert and create this professional distance and create fear and lack and you need to create a longing for what you have, you know, it, to, in your client base or in your potential client base. And, and um, we're really showing up we're doing our best to show up with that leadership and taking on that responsibility of creating the new way and creating in marketing, right, in business, a field of relatedness and connectedness and engagement marketing is, is what we're really all about. And, and people are just kind of blown away. They're like, wait a minute, I've been taught that, you know, I just need to create more tactics, more Facebook ads, more, more push marketing. And we're saying, hey, let's have conversations with people. And let's have conversations without an agenda of selling. Because I see, I see that happening so much as well. Immediately, it's like, um, you know, you have these networks of other small business owners, and they're positioned as a mastermind. We're coming together to do that collaboration and co-creation that you were talking about, David. And and it's not ending up bad. It's ending up like, hi, let's have a phone conversation, and I'm going to sell you my thing. Mm -hmm. And so I agree. We need to be the ones to change this narrative. We need to be the ones to always be looking at ourselves. How are we positioning ourselves um, in business? And I love Brene Brown as an example. I think that's a, that's a great example. And um, I'm really encouraged by what I'm seeing. I'm encouraged by people showing up and saying, the system is broken. Like, this is broken. You know, I feel yucky about my marketing and how I'm doing business. You know, people are not attracting people to me. What is this new way? And it really is going back to old school. You know, we're like, 
pick up the phone and call that person. Um, send a person, hand write a letter. Oh my gosh, what a concept. You know, do something disruptive and different to show up and connect. Write a letter. Write a letter. Whoever writes a letter today. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. My mother used to do those. Yeah. Yeah. We are learning in old age. And I have to agree with Kim. I, I, the courage to be here, for instance, let me see mm -hmm. with my, you know, wrinkles getting older. And so I got it oh. by doing your courses, oh. Catherine. Oh. It's really, it was life transforming. And I really, you know, I feel it's now the time. How long do I wait? I'm over 60 now to uh, have to go, you know. And so I do. And yeah, and I don't feel really, you know, entitled to much, but I just do it and learning by doing. So. Well, and look at the value of relationship because look at what you're, you've created with Mark. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've known you for years. You're coming into your own mm -hmm. in relationship with Mark. Yes, and I think that that what's emerging is is we're moving out of that time where we had to go off, you know, to the mountaintop to meditate in isolation to come into the fullness of who we are, and we are coming to the place where we recognize that we actually need each other to come into the fullness of who we are, and so we are fast growing our relationship skills to be able to move us beyond competition and into cooperation. And that does require a lot of self-awareness, a lot of interiority, uh, self-responsibility, uh, the practice of being able to see yourself as source. So that's where you know, we're moving our consciousness forward in service really to this larger emergence of, of coming into the fullness of our capacity for creative contribution which is dependent upon our connections with each other. Great, thank you. That was really well said. I'm tempted to butt in one little thing here because uh, Heidi and I are obviously in the <coughs> second half of life, you know, <laughs> and we are extending relationship to older people. We're yeah. getting interested in this now. We, we've gone through racism. We've gone through sexism. We've gone in through sexual orientation. And now the last legally okay thing to do is to criticize old people. Well, we really want to put an end to that. And that is what we'll be talking about in Hungary at the International European wow, Conference. Wow, wonderful. So, Wonderful. So, ageism. Ageism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. We, are history. You know, we have, I'm sorry, just one second. Uh, beginning from 60 to our expected lifespan, which for many of us will be into 90s and even perhaps 100 or more, that's just as long as our rear life, just as long as that family life, you know, <laughs> and all the stress. And, and difficulties of that period. And integral is not just for kids. It's our future too, you know. And we need to grab that and shape that second half of life according to what we understand it can be. And not what somebody else designs for us and puts us in a box. Yeah. Okay, I'm done for now. <laughs> Come to Hungary, hear the rest of the story. <laughs> Can I, uh, I was going to say, I'm going to add something to this. It's quite fascinating. Um, Catherine mentioned interiority, and um, you, Mark, just mentioned age, ageism. And, you know, all these things kind of are uh, related in many ways. Now, at the time when we lived as a tribe, the older people in the tribe were a human resource because they had survived, and they were a source of knowledge, and they were valued as such because they were valuable to the tribe. And as things scale, new became individuals and compartmentalized. The value, the perceived value of the individual, um, was measured through a productivity quotient, if you like, which was very, um, you know, hallmark of the industrialist society we were in. And we lost, um, we lost um, our view of that value of the individual. And we're sort of rethinking that now. So, 
when it comes down to the question of today, what is the value of an individual? Um, we've gone, we we are going, I should say, because it's not yet complete as a process, from a materialistic counting process where you say, well, he's got a car and a house, the swimming pool, and you know, um, shares in that company, and uh, you know, a, a retirement fund, to actually realizing that the value of an individual, any individual, is determined by the number of people he actually impacts upon. So as we age and grow, interiority <laughs> becomes something which naturally we grow into. Uh, you know, it might be hard to, to sort of feel it when you're 20 and driven by all sorts of things, but as you get older, it actually becomes part of the process, which enhances and augments the kind of value which you bring to the conversation. And I think we're beginning to realize that slowly now. We begin to realize that either we all matter equally, or none of us do. And actually to have the compartmentalized assessment of an individual according to perhaps a dollar value or you know the size of a house or the size of a car is a very short sighted and you know sort of um, poorly thought through process of actually putting um, a value on what somebody contributes contributes to society at large. So I think this is a conversation which is catalytic in many ways and it's going to challenge a lot of things. Um, and it has already started, but we're still at the very early stages of it. So I'm very glad you're actually having this conversation in Hungary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I will bring it back to the uh, intimate relationships because we were also use what you said before, we choose people, Martin, no? Uh, this one, I first, my first marriage, I choose my first husband because he had a BMW and he was much older than me and you know that's also a way uh, how we choose people uh, would you like to, to speak a little bit about the value of the individual in a in a relationship and how it is on the market <laughs> on the love market two things that i'm particularly interested in and in working on so like my new book and the create a dialectic between males and females because i think i'm not really a, a social media expert but I think it can also separate people into certain groups, certainly stratified along consciousness or social status lines. And, and we're, you know, if we remove ourselves from the street, so to speak, you know, where, where we would, would meet people of different uh, um, worldviews, etc., uh, we can easily find sort of like our little bubble, our uh, resonate with and then just exclude everybody else who doesn't share our our worldview and and secondly I'm, I'm also increasingly interested how how males and females can can be in a, in a different dialectic co-creative process and, and very often I see that from my perspective drifting a, a, a apart a little bit and my my final comment uh, may be that I'm I'm looking at, at this idea that that the next higher level of consciousness uh, always solved the problems of the, the previous levels and uh, which the, the new solutions increase then in, in complexity and if we look at, at birth rates then we see increasingly that, that people who are at higher levels of consciousness procreate much less than, than people who are at lower levels and we still don't have the educational and, and other systems in place to uh, support people in, in you know who are born into lower income, lower social class, lower consciousness families, that these children get raised you know higher level find the solution. So so even though social media allows us to connect with other people who are at our level and maybe our gender and our our interest and we're, we're putting all these positive uh, thoughts and love and energy out into the world, there is also so like a you know, a vast, an increasing majority of people who are, what's the word, disadvantaged or, or disfranchised in a way. And uh, I think sometimes we need to be careful not to live somewhat in a, you know, in our in our own integral or, or postmodern bubble, and uh, you know, forget about all the people uh, that are not in our realm. That would be my closing words. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Martin. Really. Thank yeah. you for having me. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's just a little bit of a sidebar to this conversation, but it fits, and that is in terms of social media, there's um, a large 
uh, social community online called Reddit. And I don't know if you've heard of it, but um, it is very interesting. And it, I find myself repelled by Facebook and drawn by Reddit. And here's some of the reason why. Uh, at, at Reddit, there are these really literally thousands of silos, these communities called subreddits, where people talk about relationships or they talk about politics or they talk about refixing cars or dog training or what, just anything you can imagine. And people post things and they might post a question or something and then people comment on it. And so this, this Reddit is basically consists of a huge comment section that can go on for, you know, 80 feet. I mean, it's, they're just endless. There's thousands of comments. And what's interesting about it is that each comment is available to be upvoted or downvoted by anybody who's reading. And so there's a natural, amazing wisdom of crowd effect that keeps frothing these wise or good or appropriate or funny, whatever you, they're looking for, or sexy. You know, there's some you know, sexy sites there too. Uh, whatever it might be, that it, the cream continues to rise to the top. And then there's also moderators, at least in the larger subreddits. So, you know, they just don't let flaming happen. And, you know, so a lot of the bad behavior is just taken out. So with those two tweaks to, this, to the comment section, if you will, you get an amazing conversation and a fount of wisdom about just what it is to be human in all sorts of categories. And you'll actually literally have conversations where it'll be 20 people, different people, and yet the conversation is completely coherent, uh, comment by comment. So I'm just saying, it's worth as evolutionaries, as we look at what, what may be next, I love what you said, Catherine, about real intimacy can be had online. I can't say I've had that yet, in a way. I've had certain tastes of it, but I know it's true, and I know it's coming. And I'm always interested in, you know, what's the technology? What are the, you know, what's going to, what's the habits, interior technology and exterior technology, that is going to allow that to happen? So, check out Reddit. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, can I add something on that? Because <laughs> I'm intimately familiar with Reddit and its culture, and you're quite right, there can be, I mean, the people who are there call themselves Redditors, and there is a culture in terms of how they perceive themselves, which actually unites them. But let's not forget that there's also a dark underside to this, when the notorious incident happened with Jennifer Lawrence, where her phone was hacked and intimate pictures were posted everywhere. We had Reddit as the primary uh, mover of a congregation of largely men, I suppose, getting together and, and basically, um, apart from the comments themselves, which were incredibly um, damning, um, there was also the, the propagation of pictures which shouldn't have been propagated, perhaps. So I think they fed into a frenzy which, again, created a, you know, the worst possible attribute of humanity, if you like, and they egged each other on. And this is indicative of the culture of permission which we give each other, which unless it has a certain amount of mindfulness in it, only creates a mob instead of a crowd, and it leads to thoughtless, destructive, and certainly um, not culture in any way, any sense of the word, um, behavior. And it's still driven by technology. So, you know, we, we must keep in mind that everything which we do technologically, it's a tool. We are ultimately the motive force behind it, we're the ones who are going to determine how it's going to, to come out. To, you know, to say that we are subject to something and we can't um, behave because of it is simply to use an excuse not to take responsibility for our actions. And as it happens, I'm a moderator in a number of communities which are fitness related, where anonymity is guaranteed and usually if you get into that, um, you know, usually what happens is you get, you know, everybody sort of uh, picking on everybody else because fitness is one of those areas where everybody's opinion is the one true opinion and everybody else just doesn't count. And yet, because of the way we have structured those communities, because of the air of non-judgment and vulnerability and openness which we have, despite the fact that anonymity is guaranteed, everybody tries to raise everybody up, they keep an open mind, they look at theories. The point is, that you know how we create things is integral to how they end up. The initial conditions are really important. 
the technology itself is only a manifestation, it's, in, it's incidental, but how we actually connect with each other as a person, how are we prepared to do that connection, to, to make that connection and validate it and continue to, to process it is integral to how we succeed as people and where we end up as a collective. And that's really the key of it. What you're saying is you need initial rules and the rules determine which will come out. Actually, we did that together. We had initial <laughs> rules, yeah, yeah. how we would uh, uh, act and re yeah. respond. I think, in yeah, and I think, <laughs> yes, and I think the same with relationships. You know, if we start mm -hmm. off a relationship which is purely physical and the attraction is there, it's undeniable, etc., and there's no depth to it, what happens after a while? You know, those rules which attracted two people together drive them apart because they find somebody else who's slightly better. And suddenly, you know, it breaks down because, but it's true to its initial conditions, which were physical attraction. And, ha, huh, okay, I'm not attracted to you as much anymore, but I'm attracted to him or her, and so on. But if the initial conditions are different, or, you know, they're multi layered and take into account a lot of other things then they lead to a development which goes deeper, it is more mutually beneficial, and real relationships between people actually create a synthesis where the two are greater than the one. You have two minds, two perspectives, two you know, drives, and one picks the other up when one is down, right? Absolutely. Communities, the best communities we've seen work that way. We work to raise everybody up, and we know we're not perfect on our own, no matter how good we are, how strong, how clever, how beautiful, we will always fail because we're alone. So if we don't have that sense of belonging, that sense of safety, that, hey, when I fall, it's not going to be an endless fall and somebody will help me up. If we don't have that, then we have no community, we have no values, there's very little hope, and you get this kind of constant friction which is, you know, it's not, it's the opposite of constructive. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have had a show about the lower left speaking in Wilburys, <laughs> the we space, mm -hmm. indeed. And it's very fascinating. I know that's where my crucible is, so to speak, where I get ground down, not ground down, ground up, you know? <laughs> okay, it works that way too. And uh, I would like to, uh, to ask Elisa, and Kim, about your experience with community. You are community building too for a while, so uh, how is it? Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Um, well, first of all, to tag on to this discussion here of the whole internet thing, I think, you know, the internet is, and it, you know, it's really just. I feel like it's the real world on steroids. It amplifies the effect of everything that we're talking about. Connections, they're made faster, but also you have the dark side. You have the dark side in the real world too. I mean, we've had it forever, but now like it only takes one second for something to get from California where I am right now to Italy, <laughs> where you are right now to spread a lie. You know, do something horrible like David was talking about. So now what we're working with is this thing of having to manage, as David was saying, um, a technology in our infancy of understanding and relating in it with it to it. So there's this piece of um, how, to me, it's like these two things that are so important is creating digital intimacy, which we can do um, in community. Um, and I'll get to that and I'll let Kim pop in on this idea of creating that bond and community. So there's this digital intimacy thing, but I also think there's this other thing that we have to look at, which is digital integrity. In the same way that in, in Japan, certain ways of acting, it's like, well, there needs to be some digital integrity as well. So how does digital, how do we define digital integrity? How do we monitor that well yeah if you have a moderator of a group they can sort of be there to to make sure that the people of the group are being really in integrity and and holding to certain agreed um, rules of communicating and connecting that are held at a certain level of um, of consciousness or, or communication and really 
our belief is that in this world of online intimacy and digital intimacy, it's it, it's sort of like this is how I think of it is it's so much easier to start small when you're developing a group and starting to build a community because trying to just get yourself out there and be out with the masses it's a hard thing to manage it's a hard thing to manage if we're trying to do this and yet we're on we're in new territory like how do we do this so in in my experience it's been easier to develop these intimate connections at a small level and then very soon there's that compound effect that it's almost like an exponential effect that I only have to have a few really um, good connections and then it's the whole thing like okay well then people are going to tell their friends and they're going to come and you start to build in that way so it's a natural way that it happens offline you can have digital intimacy online as well but we just haven't had we've only been doing this for a decade or less even um, so we don't really have the rule book down yet of how this works and technology is changing every day so there's always something new to remember like oh my god now I can't do this or I can't and there's another thing added to this and how do I use that <laughs> that for people who are digital immigrants like anyone who wasn't born with an iPhone in their hand <laughs> then that's harder to learn however I'm gonna digress just for a moment my daughter who's 13 grew up on like it's an extension of her psyche that phone is an extension of her psyche ships through social media like Snapchat and I'm trying to figure it out and she's like rolls her eyes mom oh my god did you really just ask me that question <laughs> like I'm trying to understand how you're connecting with your community <laughs> here it's they have I don't know what's gonna happen what we talked in this discussion about you know our age group and Millennials but Millennials didn't even grow up with iPads and iPhones so what about like the generations, you know, yeah, the who next are born generation, with it. Who are yeah. born with it? It's going to be very interesting. But anyways, I I sort of over. So you <laughs> hop in and say what your two pieces are. About. I didn't really answer the question. Just had some thoughts there. <laughs> I can't remember what the question was. It but was how do we build community <laughs> online? Right, right. And I, I, you know, I think that that piece that you brought in about digital integrity is really important. We were just talking about this yesterday about how people will do stuff online that they would never do face to face with another person. You know, they say things, and and there's this you know slanderous behavior that's happening. It's so true, and so how do we really? I think one is to have those shared agreements that you all were talking about, rules or whatever we want to call them. I think that's really important, but I think even more important is for us to model that, you know, and and to have shared agreements with ourselves. Like, how am I really going to show up? How am I going to be in this virtual space? myself, how am I going to be with my, my team, if it's a company or an organization that you have, what are those shared agreements, and it really, really is just coming back to, from kindergarten, things about creating community, and then as David was talking about you know, creating, I think it's very easy once someone has thought, you know, held up their hand and said, yes, I want to be part of that community, I feel a connection, I feel shared values or whatever, once you're on the inside, it's easy, but how do we do that? How do we create the relatedness before that on the outside? How do we, you know, and, and, and Heidi and Mark, you're doing this with, with things like this, live stream video where it's just open, right, to the public and people can show up and see, oh, do I feel a sense of relatedness within this format, you know, or, or um, like I was saying, in our, in our marketing, in our communications. Um, so I think that also, you know, to the wider global community is important to have those shared values with yourself and those principles and guidelines. And then also once people get inside of your community to have that perpetuated as well.
Yeah, and I would like to add, you say that people say on, uh, on the internet things they would never say live, but the thing is, it might be a boomerang because now it's everything recorded, everything is out, and maybe in 20 years uh, you would regret. While in real life, in 20 years, nobody remembers what you what you said and what you did. Why <laughs> internet serves everything, so this is a little bit tricky. And I think uh, for young people, they should know that well. I would like to wrap up a little bit and give you the opportunity to give a final word, condemnation of your contribution on your ideas, your objections for the future. Yeah. Yeah. Who wants to wrap up? Say the final comments. <laughs> well, uh, okay, I, I'll do it. Basically, <clears throat> um, we're in an evolving sphere where things are changing fast. Um, that includes our identities, it includes the challenges we face, and it includes a narrative of self. Um, it's everything else. The only way to, to stay true in all this is to be who you are. Uh, and that is the core of you which informs everything which you do, which is part of your journey. Uh, so you just got to be open and authentic and as vulnerable as you can within certain um, parameters and, and trust that um, there will be a reciprocation which will allow you to move forward. And it's a, it's, you need to be brave. It's a brave thing to do. But if you're not willing to do it, then we go back into our boxes and we go back to the 20th century and we stay in our darkness, and I don't think anybody wants to do that. No. Yeah, so right. Anybody else have a final uh, comment? Well, I just, I'm very inspired um, that we're getting together to talk about uh, relatedness in our postmodern world, and um, delighted to be co creating with all of you aware that uh, we are just living at such an extraordinary privileged time to be able to create uh, the world and the future with our words together and the sharing of our ideas across the many, many miles. And, um, and just want to acknowledge all of my peers here for your leadership and your goodness and your, for giving you know, of such depth and intelligence of yourselves to this noble purpose. And I want to thank our hosts as well. Heidi and Mark, thank you so much for furthering the goodness of the world and the heart of the world. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'll um, go. Uh, I um, I very inspired as well. And, um, and I love what you said, David, a minute ago about um, just be who you are. And I think we have uh, more and more opportunity to be ever more who we are. And I always think of the wonderful quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he said, each church has a congregation of one. <laughs> and I love that. It's just we're all so unique and so different. And how wonderful it is to have an opportunity as we evolve to continue to, in my case, be ever more Jeff. And so I would just encourage uh, you to be ever more David and you, Catherine, to be ever more Catherine and Kim and Lisa and Mark and Heidi, and I think the rest will take care of itself. Thank you. This is well. Thank That's you. Wonderful. Yeah. All right. Anybody else before we hang up? Sure, yeah. So I'll, I'll speak on behalf of the two of us, sort of like, combine us into one and just want to say thank you so much Heidi and Mark for having us as part of this discussion. This is such an important discussion and bringing together just wonderful brilliant minds um, with each so many unique perspectives that um, enrich the conversation and move the narrative forward and um, just so much gratitude for this and I guess I can say for us that um, keep on connecting. Be your outrageous, loving self and spread that love through your connection, through your conversations. Be in integrity in the same way that uh, online as you would offline. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be Mark Ish. Will you be Heidi Ish? <laughs> More Heidi Ish than yes. ever. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and I'm very grateful for the viewers who have shown up and who want to see it in replay, watch it in replay. And I remind you mm -hmm. that here are all the replays in edited form, and there will be also the name tags where they were missing then later, and you get it on www.bit.ly slash wisdom factory. Mm -hmm. And after the show, we have um, a conversation for everybody on Blab. <clears throat> I don't know if you know this channel. Some of you do. And this is my um, handle, blab.in slash traviata56. And we will gather there in about 10 minutes and talk about continue the conversation. Who is time of you is welcome, but it's also for people who have watched us here and want to participate in the conversation and whoever comes in. And I'm really, really grateful that you came to our uh, series. It was a long time I, I am the planner here and he uh, <laughs> great for uh, emotional, support. Uh, <laughs> emotional support and uh, contributing, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. I, without him, wouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. I really need to say, because when you are alone doing everything for yourself, I'm also mm, feminine, like, you know, or hiding back and so on, and this is good, say it, you know, and so <laughs> I'm very grateful for that, and I hope I see you again, and yeah. we will continue the Wisdom Factory with conversations that matter, and if you feel that there is a conversation that matters and has not yet been addressed, please, audience, ever Tess and we will make um, an episode out of it. We will. Okay, mm -hmm. invite the guest of your choice. Okay. Thanks for a great so, finale to the series, everybody. Yeah, this, this is, is the great finale. We forgot the champagne uh, or the water. This is the hey, trivia. That's my water. Oh, it's you, brother. Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. bye. <laughs>